The text this morning is the uh, epistle reading, the second reading in 1 Corinthians 9. Um, I need to go back through um, most of 16 and 17. He says, a necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But not of my own will, I am still entrusted with the stewardship. This is our text. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, that little bit at the end of that reading talks about the, you know, athletes competing, etc. Uh, I was thinking about that a little bit. Um, I, have you noticed that uh, amateur athletes now, you know, college students and Olympians are all looking to get paid to, to do what they do uh, to end their amateurness, I guess. It uh, used to be that there were some pretty powerful rules in place to keep amateur athletes amateur. Uh, and, and, you know, but things uh, have run into a little trouble with the Olympians especially because some of the countries, they go around the rules a little bit. Like the Russians, all, all of their athletes are in the Army, so they get paid uh, uh, to, to be in the Army, and, and it's just been sort of sneaky. But, see, the, the, the reason that they're thinking about this is because it, it's hard to do what they do. Uh, it's, uh, what would you say, an expensive discipline to uh, carry yourself along and do those magnificent things that they do. Uh, and and uh, if they can't be supported carefully, uh, up to now, that's always been, would you say, uh, private donations and stuff to help them be supported, alumni associations take care of colleges, and, and there are donors that uh, look after Olympic athletes, et cetera. But uh, they, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing for me uh, in, in a lot of ways because I, I, I wonder why it is that they actually compete. Because uh, it can't be because of money. I mean, I suppose some of them are uh, ambitious enough to be looking for money in the future, but it seems to me that when you compete at that level, you can compete to win. I mean, that's the purpose of the thing, to, to win and to be strong. And uh, uh, to, to, uh, in the case of Olympians, to glorify your country, so to speak. So it seems like paying them would undo that an awful lot. You've seen that in some of the Olympic Games since they started messing around like this. Uh, hockey teams that act stupid and uh, basketball players that are in trouble all the time. It's just it's difficult for me. Well, I'm bringing this up because there was some pressure from uh, a few Jerusalem Jews uh, that they were traveling to places that Paul had been. They were kind of going behind him, uh, thinking that, you know, we're the guys from Jerusalem, we know everything, uh, and what Paul is doing has been a problem for them. So, because uh, he's telling them that, uh, when you're a Gentile, you don't have to be a Jew to be a Christian, and, uh, and it kind of undermines their thinking. And, and, and so they've been trying to think up a bunch of different arguments to undermine him. And one of them is that he doesn't get paid, so, you know, which is a little weird. Uh, they, they're saying that uh, the, the churches, the congregations that he's going to, are not paying him. So he's not really with them. He's not legitimately with them. He's an itinerant preacher, which is a problem for some people. Um, and and uh, Jews in particular really, really didn't like that very much. Is one of the reasons they fussed at Jesus all the time. But it, he was getting support from other ministries. Uh, he was getting support from uh, people that travel with him. He was getting support from his own work as a tent maker. And, and so since the, the people weren't paying him, they were saying, well, he's not a real preacher. He's, he's uh, just after proselytes to follow him. And, and he's, not really, uh, he's not really a proper preacher because they would be expected to be paid. Well, and since they didn't pay him, they stood in that place and they would undermine him because he apparently has no real legitimacy. Yeah, I, one of the things that they even said, you know, uh, was that 
Out of Jesus' own mouth, uh, uh, a worker is owed his wages, which is true to some extent, uh, and that's something that shows up multiple times in Scripture, even in the Old Testament. Uh, out of the blue, it says a little weird thing about uh, don't muzzle an ox when he's uh, plowing the fields because he's, he's entitled to whatever he can eat, uh, which is a little weird. But uh, this, this is the kind of thing. They're saying if, you, if you're not engaged like that, then you don't really count. There's something illegitimate about you. Okay, so Paul has to explain himself here, and he does here. Uh, he says that, well, he's doing a stewardship for the gospel. Now, you know, stewardship to us means something different. It's about money again, but uh, he's saying that he is a manager on God's behalf for distribution of the good news of the gospel, for people to be saved. And, and he does this not for himself, uh, but for Christ. Now, uh, here we sit. You'd expect to pay for church workers. I'm kind of interested in that, you know, personally. You understand how that goes. All right, but, uh, and, and, and you don't have any real problem with that, but most of them would tell you, I, I mean church workers, that the... The getting paid is uh, necessary to live in this world because, you know, you have to eat. And uh, a lot of us have families we have to take care of. And uh, it's hard to even do the ministry of the gospel, the, the, that stewardship that's laid in our hands. If, if we can't get around anywhere, that means you need some money for a vehicle and for gas and for food because you kind of collapse if you don't eat occasionally. And... Uh, this is true for any vocation. You can't do anything, really, in this world such as it is without being paid for the work that you do. And so, you know, this is some difficulty here, but uh, let me just uh, ask you this way. It's a, a little bit different maybe than you've thought about it. Um, do you charge for forgiveness? Actually, here we are at church, and... and uh, uh, if you were uh, faced with somebody who was ailing about their sinfulness and, and uh, it, it becomes your stewardship of the gospel to forgive them, would you charge them for it? <laughs> Joe would. Yeah. I, saw you, I see you back there, Joe. Uh, see, uh, uh, are, are, would you be owed because of gratitude? That you know that you should get something out of forgiving somebody, or or uh, what? What if you uh, found yourself in an emergency and you had to baptize somebody? Should you get paid for that? Or or even you know we had Leonardo up here not too long ago. Should we charge them for baptizing him? I, I'm thinking about it right now, Freddie. Just you know. <laughs> But you understand that this is, this is not something that we do. Uh, what about uh, if, if someone comes to communion, should we charge them for that? Uh, could you, should you tell them, well, you owe God because uh, he's forgiving you, so you should, you should pay him. Uh, and that means pay the church and whatever. Is that the way we function? Does God owe you for providing that service to those who receive it? That's, you know, one of the reasons we exist at all is to provide that stuff to people that need it, right? Uh, to to, to, to uh, operate a stewardship for God in Christ to pr forgive people in baptisms and communion and, 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 and just the simple announcement of his grace. Can you charge for that? Uh, uh, you know, you understand the problem. There are churches that do, by the way. Uh, I was aware of a church up in St. Louis when I was a... A seminarian that uh, a Lutheran church, mind you, that made sure they got a look at everybody's 1040. Uh, you know, to know what you're paying in taxes and what your income is, so they could get the right share out of that. And everybody was required to do that. It was a condition of membership. Uh, some churches charge for you to use the church for a baptism or a wedding or whatever funeral. Uh, I actually think on the books that some of that stuff is required here, but we never get around to it. Well, um, are you owed for that sort of thing? 
Uh, are, are you not a church worker in any real sense? I mean, you really are, are you not? Because you go out of here and, and you do things for your church, uh, whether you're helping around uh, the neighborhoods, uh, painting the windows. You're not supposed to paint the windows. That's probably the wrong thing. Pa painting the doors. Now the doors are glass. You're not supposed to paint those either. Ethan, what do we paint? Walls. We paint walls. Okay. You know, sometimes you wake up on Sunday morning and you can't think. I, yeah, <laughs> but but you do do things, and you do forgive people, and you do walk around out there helping folks, and you do it in the name of Christ. Should you get paid, or are you a steward, or is there a difference? You can see how difficult this is. I mean, it doesn't seem like there'd be any real problem because I know you don't think about this really, but maybe you should think about it. It's, Paul's bringing it up, so it must be important. Uh, how is it supposed to work? As for anyone who does anything in the kingdom of God, no matter what the vocation is, and, and I say this seriously, uh, whether you're an elder or a pastor or you shepherd goats or, or if you are a babysitter or an EMT or, or a plumber or whatever else you do out there in the world, whatever it is, Christians serve people for Christ. So you know, they need service, they need to be cared for, they need to be worked with, uh, and, and you do it for Christ. This is what we do in the kingdom of God. So we're citizens of heaven, not of earth. And so we serve Christ, and he takes care of people. So um, they, you, they have need, and you can fill it, and there is a stewardship there. And, and by the way of the world, sometimes you're going to get paid for that. You know, if you have a vocation, if you have a profession, you, you, you hopefully grateful to the one that came and did something for you and you pay them it's required just by the way society works because everybody's got to eat but uh um, but you don't do it for that i mean you need to be paid and there's some truth in that but the uh, the f uh, full effect is you are working for christ you are caring for people in ways that they can't care for themselves i mean that's what plumbers do right if you can't fix the pipes, you get a plumber to do it. And you pay them because you care for them and because they need it. Uh, and this is the way it works. I mean, there is a rule that you have to pay people that work for you, but this is, the, this is the discipline of Christ that we're talking about here. You're citizens of heaven. You're not bound by any of the rules here, but you do things because, uh, because they need to be done for people in the world. You, you work gratefully for the one who sent you. You work for Christ. The law of Christ, Paul mentioned, is, is the discipline that you follow as a disciple of Christ. I don't know if you can hear it, but disciple, discipline, they're connected. Now, that doesn't mean that you're getting punished all the time, because we think, go right there for discipline, right? But that's not what I mean. There is a discipline for being a mechanic. There is a discipline for uh, being an accountant. It, there are certain things that you have to do a certain way for those things to work properly. Uh, in this particular case, when you follow Jesus, there is a discipline about that. There is a certain way that you're supposed to go about that. You have authority in this world with Christ to forgive. It's a gift that he gave you, an authority that he gave you. And you also have talents from God to serve people. So that's what we do. Not because you must, but because you want to. As to what is owed you, this uh, same Christ that we're talking about here says this very difficult thing. Freely you received... Freely give. Now, see, now, what, what, what happens here is, is that you have been saved in his service of sacrifice and death. That's already happened. In the kingdom of God, you are heirs. Uh, as citizens of heaven, you are heirs of heaven and earth. It's, it's been given to you. It's yours. 
For you, there can be only the appearance of loss. Even your death is just uh, a, a moment uh, apart from your body until you're with Jesus. And then when he comes again, he's going to make all that perfect and whole. This is already given to you. This is the promise. This is the hope. This is the, the, the things that have happened in the cross. The, everything, everything that you will ever need has been given to you already. Therefore, since it's been freely given, you can freely give your service as one in authority, as one with resources that Christ has laid in your hands to work on earth, not for a wage, though you might receive one, uh, not for compulsion because you have to, because Christ has freed you from that, though the Holy Spirit will encourage you and point you the way. But you do it for love. Love compels you. Gratitude for what Christ has already done for you as he saved you in his blood. In those things you do. This is a, a, a sort of discipline. As I said, it's not punishment, but it is the way that we walk with God. It's a, a structure to manage God's gifts and grace for you all as you walk around in this world with God as citizens of heaven, as heirs of uh, all things. These things have been given to you, and, and they have been given to you before anybody asked you to do anything. All of this was laid in your hands, your resources, the grace of God, your talents, your encouragement, your sacraments, your church, all of these things were given to you just like they were to Paul to save some. Now I know that without resources, you can't care for anybody. On the other hand, God says, I'll take care of that. You'll always have what you need with me. So even though without resources, you can't care for yourself or your family or your customers, or anything really. Think about it like this. What if everything was paid in advance? What if everything has been paid in advance more than you could ever hope for? So this is, this is where we are right now with God, with Paul. He, he doesn't feel compelled to do anything. He does it because he wants to. He wants to do it in gratitude. He wants to do it because he's already paid in full. And he knows that it is a struggle for him, and he knows that it is a struggle for you. He talks about all this athletic competition and beating back his body and controlling himself so that, so that he can save some. That's Christ's salvation that you have. That's already been done. And so in response, in gratitude, in love, not in compulsion, not in legalism, not in pressure, but in love, we trust our Christ. We live in Christ. And like Paul, we have a ministry of the gospel in the salvation that we already have. This is the way we walk. This is the way we live. And that is Christ's kingdom. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.